<laughs> oh my goodness. Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is the book launch live cast. And look at all these happy faces that we have here today. Um, just a smattering of uh, the authors for the uh, authority uh, book. Uh, we're just so, so thrilled. So today we're going to have a chance, actually give you a chance to meet each one of the authors um, in the authority book uh, to learn more about the book uh, and really to learn more about building authority in your business and your life. That is the overarching theme around this book. So we're super excited. Um, in fact, you may have picked up the book is actually available today. Um, today is the book launch and we've got a, we're doing something really special with it. Um, but you can get it, uh, the Kindle version or the Nook version or the Kobo version for 99 cents today. Uh, the paperback, of course, is uh, also available. But we're going to dive into these interviews uh, to learn more and more about authority. So, uh, by the way, everybody, say hi. Say hey. hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hey. Hello, hello. 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 This is fantastic. Now, as you're, uh, as you're watching the live cast, feel free to put your comments in yeah. and ask questions of individual authors. And we'll do our best to pass those questions along. Also, please share the live cast with anybody else that you think could benefit from greater credibility, greater authority, and expertise in their subject uh, area. Uh, please do that for us. All right, so let's hear. I'm going to see. I'm going to. This is going to be an experiment here. I'm going to try to clear the boards without kicking anybody out of the live cast entirely. Let's see what happens if I do this. Okay, very good. And then, uh, Jen, I want to first interview uh, and introduce Jen Foster. Um, Jen is a good friend of mine. Uh, she has been a best selling author not once or twice, but 15 times. Um, she is the co owner of Elite Online Publishing. It also owns Biz Social Boom, companies dedicated to helping business owners of all sizes thrive in today's highly technical world of product and service promotion. Um, Jen comes from a family of entrepreneurs, of successful entrepreneurs. Um, her grandfather started the Maverick Country Stores oil and gas station chain. That's crazy. I did not know that, Jen. Um, yeah. let's, let's, let's bring you on here. And... Um, well, gosh, Jen, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us a tell us a bit about your chapter. Tell us tell us what you contributed to the book Authority. Yeah, so my chapter is about becoming an expert and helping people to understand that you are an expert and getting those raving fans. So that's what my book my chapter is about, and I'm really excited to be a part of this book. I mean, this book really does talk about how you can become the authority, or if you were the authority before and now nobody knows it, you can become the authority again by writing a book. And that's what my chapter is about. Okay, so you know a ton about authority, having published a gazillion books um, for yourself and for your and for clients. What's uh, one of the best nuggets that you feel like you can share from your chapter? Um, well, I or really a, or a nugget. Now, I don't need yeah, to. I, say, no. I really want you to get a copy of the book, especially because it's only ninety nine cents today. Um, but you know, I have a few quotes in there, so I'll just read you one of my favorite quotes um, by Albert Einstein. It's if you can't explain it to a six year old, then you don't know it yourself. And that's something that you know, if you're an authority on a subject, you know the content and it's easy to understand. So I just love that quote by Albert Einstein and that's that's part of a little tiny bit of a nugget of what's in my chapter. Okay. So Jen, tell me if you were if you got a hold of yourself when you were about 12. If you got a hold of yourself when you were about 12 and you were able to pass something on to them that you wish you knew then that you know now. What would that be? Mm, that's a really good question. I would probably say the the confidence factor, right? Like, you know, when you're 12, you don't have that much confidence. So I think uh, I would I would tell myself, you know, if you just feel that confidence when you do have that confidence and keep that confidence, then you can do anything. So I think that it's the confidence factor of of believing in yourself. Okay, so. I also want to throw in a question here quickly about this uh, project 
because this project came about, uh, I mean, with a, a huge portion of your uh, influence uh, as we created this anthology about authority from uh, a variety of authors. What did you see that was special about it? Like what kind of what was your inspiration for? Hey, yeah, let's do this thing. Let's do this authority book. Yeah, well, you know, I think I've done a couple of collaboration books before in the past, but I think, you know, what got me excited about this one was, you know, a few of the people in the book are in our mastermind group. A few are really big influencers online and offline. And I really just felt like it had such energy that I wanted to be a part of it. And so that's kind of, you know, just having that collaboration feel and having the same message all in one book about authority. I, th I just was excited to be a part of it. Awesome. Awesome. And I was going to share that as we go forward, I think we'll talk, drop little tidbits here and there about how this is a very special book launch for all of us um, as we target not just Amazon, which we've all targeted uh, many times before, but also Wall Street Journal and USA Today. So uh, that's a tease. And then we'll drop some more nuggets about that uh, as we go through. So Jen, now if you don't, here's what I want to do. I'm going to actually turn it over to you. I'm going to let you interview your fantastic uh, business partner. Does that sound like a great deal? Sounds All great. Right, let's see if I can get me out of the mix and I'm going to get Jen on the screen. I mean, uh, Melanie on the screen. Let's see how we do. Hey, Melanie, how's it going? Fantastic. So excited to be here today. What an exciting day with this book launching, all this information that's being shared. It's just so exciting for 2021. Great way to start off the year. Yeah. Well, for those of you who don't know who Melanie Johnson is, besides her being my amazing business partner, she is a 14-time best-selling author. And she not only is a best-selling author, but she has started TV stations and she was a model and she was uh, Miss, uh, runner up to Miss America. So she's got a really great bio. You can check that out um, inside the book as well. So Melanie, tell us about your chapter. What is your chapter about? So my chapter is about harnessing the power of Amazon. So, so many people don't know when you become an author, all of a sudden Amazon starts to work for you and promote you. So it's all of these secrets that you and I know and use and we help our authors do um, that we're sharing with everybody else now. Yeah, I love that you give the inside secrets because that's what people want to know. You know, it's like, hey, tell me all your your deep dark secrets, deep secrets that you can get um, on how you become an authority. So uh, before you interview Jason Van Camp, I want you to give a little nugget of part of your book. So what's something in there that? Um, people would want to read about. One of the secrets is, is that when you become an author, only authors get to have an Amazon author page, which is like a Facebook page for an author. And you get to put all this great content out there. And once you have this page, people can follow you. But not only that, Amazon search engine optimization is so strong, right? They're like the behemoth of the whole internet that they push that page up to the first page of search. So we have all these secrets that you can put on that page that really help to make it so beneficial for you and you can monetize it. We call it the million dollar page is what we call it. Um, so that's one of the big secrets out there. So when you want to know in more information, how to leverage that page and the content you should put on your Amazon author page, make sure you grab the book because all of those secrets are inside of there. Awesome. Yeah. I think it was a few years ago, Melanie and I got invited to a Super Bowl party with uh, Lee Steinberg. And if you don't know who Lee Steinberg is, is he's the Jerry Maguire. So you know the movie Jerry Maguire, that's him. Well, yep. we wanted to research more about him. So we Googled him and we were like, okay, for sure, since he's Jerry Maguire, he's gonna, his website's gonna be number one and he's gonna have all this content. Plus he's a huge you know, sports agent, all this. So we looked at him up and Google, the very first result was amazon.com. And that was all, he had two books at the time. I think he has more now, but that was his very first page. Yep. And that told everything about him. And then his website was like number four. And his Jerry Maguire stuff, of course, came up like second and third. But it was pretty incredible that Amazon had him above all the Jerry Maguire stuff. Like, that's a movie that everyone knows. Like, you would think that would be number one when you type right. in Luke Steinberg. But it was his Amazon author page. So Amazon, that is like the million dollar page for sure. Well, thank yep. you so much, Melanie. Now, I, I hear you're going to be interviewing an, another great influencer, Jason Van Camp. So I will turn the time over to you to interview him. And Everett, you can bring him up. 
There's Jason. There, there he is. There he is. I can hear you now. I, I, uh, I'm getting bad reception, so I had to come outside, but I had a hard time hearing you before, but I can hear you loud and clear right now. Well, I love seeing the blue sky behind you. Yeah. So it's like nice and bright and sunny. So, you know, I don't have your bio in front of me. First off, tell me just a little bit, give me your, your short three sentence bio on you. So everybody knows who you are. Okay. Three sentence bio on Jason Van Camp. Um, West Point graduate, played football there. Um, commissioned officer in the United States Army, became a ranger in a Green Beret, deployed uh, a few, three times to uh, the Middle East, to Korea and Africa as well. Um, got my MBA from BYU and started a company called Mission Six Zero, which offers leadership development services. And then I have a nonprofit called Warrior Rising, which helps veterans find their purpose again through business ownership. I feel like they should make a movie about your life, Jason. You yeah, know, right. there's not many guys that have your credentials, okay? <laughs> no, when compared to your bio, you, you feel kind of small. So you know. I don't think so. Green Beret, holy cow. All right, so tell us a little bit um, about your chapter. Okay, so I was honored to be invited to, to write a chapter in this amazing book and to be alongside uh, tremendous authors uh, like yourself, Melanie and Jen. You know, my chapter is about FOPO. You know, you've heard his... You've heard of FOMO, which is fear of missing out. Well, FOPO is fear of people's opinions. And it's, uh, it's an anxiety that you have when you want to say something or post something online. But the possible negative consequences of doing that are so overwhelming that you don't say or post anything because you're afraid of what other people think about you, mm. afraid of what other people are going to say about you. You are afraid of them creating a new identity for you. And uh, better still, like I talk about in the book, changing the way you think about yourself. So give us some, um, that is so good. And, and I have I have FOBO a lot of times. Here I've been a news anchor. And when I go to do live stuff, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I got to look right. I don't have my makeup on today. And I get, I get all of that stuff. It's terrible. So oh. I, I really relate to that. And even I've had so much on-camera experience that I still get that. So give us like one nugget of how to get over that. Well, first thing that I tell people is you got to figure out who you are first and foremost. You know, um, you have to find out what your values are, what you believe in. And you got to tell them, you know, don't pretend that you're somebody that you aren't. You know, once you know who you are, you got to turn the volume up. And when you're in a position of, of faux po, generally you're in a position of being a leader uh, of some sort. And being a leader is influencing other people to be the best that they can be. And when you do that, you have to let them know that you have your priorities in order. You know, you know yourself and you put the mission first, then your team, then your teammates, finally all the way at the very bottom, yourself. I love it. That's great, great information. And if you want more of that, that's just one nugget. Can you imagine all the other stuff that he's got in that chapter? So, um, Jason, if you could tell your younger self something about authority, what would you tell yourself? You know, that's a great question. So when we say, what would I tell my younger self? How old would I be? You know, like I want to tell my younger self 10 years ago, I would tell that younger self, Jason, don't neglect marketing. Don't be afraid of putting yourself out there. Jump on the social media, jump on the Facebook and the Twitter and the Instagram and the LinkedIn. Start your stuff right now. Be yourself. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. And uh, you'll find that people like who you are. You know, and uh, if I would have done this 10 years ago, um, I'd probably have millions of viewers in my mind, just like Jocko did, because we started at the same time and we have a very similar message. So um, in the military, you know, when I'm a, when I was a Green Beret, our, our uh, nickname was the quiet professional. So you sometimes think that you're going to be quiet. You're not going to talk about yourself. You're not going to put yourself out there. You're not going to do any of that. Well, you can be a quiet professional, but I urge people not to be silent professionals. I agree 100%. I did a TED Talk called uh, Leaving Life Legacy, and it's if you don't share your information, then how are you helping anyone else? You, you People complain about other people, but if you're not sharing your wisdom with them, then you have no right to complain about how they're doing it or what they're doing at the younger generation. So I love that. I love that. 
All right. And it's never too late. It's never too late to get yourself out there, I think is what you're saying too. That's the message. If you're starting from ground zero by writing a book and becoming the authority and sharing your knowledge can just uh, take you skyrocketing right up to the top. So great message, Jason. Thank you so, so much for being a part of this book. So make sure you grab the book and uh, get to read Jason's chapter and Jen's chapter and my chapter. And Everett, I'm going to toss it back to you now. All right. Very good. Thank you so much, Jason. That was awesome. Just really appreciate your perspective and having you here. Um, Melanie, you're, um, I, you know, we didn't get to read your bio uh, and I, I wanted to add it back in just so people understood that you also are a 14 time international bestselling author. You've owned a couple uh, TV stations, if I remember correctly. Um, and um, your background, media, marketing, PR, uh, advertising, and you've published over 2,600 books. Like, what the heck? Um, <laughs> and uh, news anchor, all of those things, and first runner up to Miss America. Yes, I love that. I just absolutely uh, love that. Um, hey, as a little bit of housekeeping here, um, I'm going to yeah. put up the, the buy screen again, um, but uh, I need to, let's see here, make room. Oh, we've got room. So this is good when our next uh, people come through. That'll be terrific. Jen, I had kicked you out temporarily to make room, but now we've got room for our, our next people to come in. So let's put this back up here. Um, certainly the book Authority is available today. You can pick it up uh, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, um, pretty much anywhere actually. <laughs> Um, but the digital versions are 99 cents. And we'd really encourage you to get those today because that is part of this launch strategy that we're doing. We've done lots of Amazon launches, and this is the first time many of us here have done a Wall Street Journal and USA Today targeted launch, which is a different animal entirely. Um, it requires a lot more sales. It requires sales over a much longer period of time and through a uh, variety of outlets, not just Amazon. Um, so certainly pick up your copy today uh, in paperback or digital. Um, and uh, we're excited to get your feedback uh, as well. So it looks like we're next going to go to, let's see here. Uh, Mel, it doesn't look like I don't have Jason or Nathan. So I'm going to go ahead and skip over him at this time. Is that okay? Okay. Oh, did I lose you? I lost you. Come back here. I lost your audio. Sorry. Sorry. I just, he tried to get in and um, he said, I can't get in. So I don't know if I'll, I'll see if there's I can. Room, there's room now. There's room now. We had okay, to I just let him know. We just had to make room for him. So that's good. Yeah. Well, what, um, so that's great. Uh, let's cover just a couple things while he's coming back in. Um, this book authority really came about, uh, in fact, let's do this. I'm going to get some members back on the screen here. Let's do this and add these people. All right. And these people, there we go. So um, I'm not adding everyone in right now, but uh, the authority project came about largely because of these minds right here. Uh, we were having a conversation one day in our mastermind group and um, about uh, a book and I actually had had this name and a cover kind of on the shelf thinking about it for a while uh, and um, and we decided we put this together. So um, uh, John and Christine and Mark, Melanie, Jen, um, this is exciting. It's exciting to see it come together, especially after the um, after the uh, scary glitch we had when we were going to try to launch in what October. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, here we were going to try, and then COVID happened. All these things happened, and Barnes and Noble had a hack and threw everything out. You couldn't upload a book to Barnes and Noble, so things in life happen. But what do you do? You pivot, and that's what we did, and we successfully pivoted. <laughs> yeah, that was scary. Like we were all all ready to go. Uh, we had a you know uh, we were locked and loaded. Uh, Barnes and Noble gets hacked, um, and then suddenly our book just doesn't show. Just doesn't show up, right? Um, and that would have been a really horrible time to try uh, to try to launch there. Well, it's great. So Nathan is in the house. So let's do this. I'm going to um, I'm going to take it to you, Melanie, to introduce Nathan. And I'm not going to spill any of the beans about him. I'm going to let you do all of the beans. OK, yeah, so right. mom guilt worked. I got him to show up. 
<laughs> Whoops, hang on. There he is. I'll get I'll get you here. You can tell that I am not. You're doing a great job, Everett. There he is. Hey, how you doing? All right. So Nathan Johnson is one of the authors of this book, and um, he just turned 20 not too long ago. He's an entrepreneur. He started when he was 13 um, on Instagram, having Instagram sites. He uh, sells advertising. If you're looking to advertise on Instagram, that's what he does. He does it for creators. He does it for models. He does it for brands. He creates ads. He places ads on different influencers places. And um, I have to say, I'm really proud of him. He's like blown it up this last year. He refocused and um, decided to just blow up his Instagram. He has over 6 million. I think that's right, right? Over 6 million followers between all of his pages and still growing. So um, that's Nathan Johnson. And uh, so Nathan, welcome. Thanks for being a part of the book. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about your chapter. So my chapter is just really about what I love to do and, and, why the past you know, 10 years of my life have been really focused on it. Um, a lot of people didn't see the positive to social media when it comes to business uh, and how it can benefit your business. Um, but since I was 13, I had been focusing on it and trying to tell people that it was going to be the new big thing and that everybody needs to be there. So now that social media is this big thing that I, that I predicted it to be, it's important for people to understand how to use it and how to leverage it for their business. Because now if you're not leveraging social media, then you're doing something wrong. As, That's so true. So yeah. give us some nuggets from your chapter. What's like one or two nuggets you can give us that you put in your chapter? So the biggest thing that I talked about in the chapter is kind of your, your brand image on your social media. So, as weird as it may sound, there are dentists and doctors that are on social media now. So I've talked to people about this and um, personally have worked with some dentists and doctors on social media. And in their discussions, in our discussions, they revealed to me that oftentimes people will only go to them and go see them because they have followers or because they're verified on Instagram. So dentists on average they make thousands of dollars per and same thing with orthodontist is if they're a reoccurring you know customer or patient that always comes in we've been seeing the same dentist for our entire lives so there are thousands of dollars made on each of their recurring patients and they say that the value of each patient could be anywhere between a hundred dollars if they only come in once or a thousand dollars if they keep coming in and their number one customer acquisition um, is through social media and through the fact that they have follower they have followers and they have a blue verified check mark which I also touch on in my chapter on how important being verified is um, so there are a lot of a lot of good nuggets in there for for anybody who's either has an existing business or is starting their own business right now um, but the the greatest nugget out of that is just you need to brand yourself as an established business even if you are not yet you you kind of have to fake it till you make it and that's the biggest thing that i've preached my entire life is you just fake it till you make it because then once you're there then you, you don't have to yeah there's somebody just commented i think of social media as being more honest than yelp and and that's it's a very true assumption that is that is now becoming a reality for a lot of people that instead of going to Yelp, you're just going to like a restaurant's Instagram page, you know, or you're going to, you know, elite online publishing Instagram page. So let me ask you, I mean, you started when you were 13 and you pressured your mother, who is me, uh -huh. into uh, getting you uh, doing a, a major investment for a 13 year old into Instagram. Mm -hmm. I think we spent $5,000. I think I must have been out of my mind, but I did it. Yeah. I believed in you. Mm -hmm. So, um, Tell us if you could tell, like, you kind of got away from it a little bit at 14, 15 years yeah. old. So if you could tell your younger self something, what would you tell yourself? Like Ooh. when you were 15? Yeah, I would I would tell younger me to not let 
other people discourage you. That's what I would tell younger me. Um, the biggest issue that I came into um, was bullying and just kind of being looked down on in high school because back when I was doing social media, it wasn't cool. Now every kid wants to be a TikToker. Every kid wants to be yeah. a, social, a YouTuber. Back then when I was in, in high school, freshman year, it was still, you know, you want to be an athlete, you know, or you want to be some the comedian, right? Um, I just wanted to be a social media comedian at the time. Now, not so much, but um, people didn't see eye to eye with me in my opinions. And um, I took a break because people were just saying, it's not going to work out. That's not how the world works. Nobody is going to be on social media like that. Um, and then I got back into it um, July of, I believe, 2017 or 2018. I like fully dedicated to it. And the story that you don't tell about that $5,500 is that she gave it to me. We invested in an account and I was so young that I let somebody else log into it who I, I, I gave my trust to. And, um, he, two days later took it from us and we never saw that account ever again. And she still yeah. continued to invest in me even to this day. Um, and now finally I've paid her back for the 5,500 and then some, um, as, as a, as an appreciation gift, but my, you know, she's a, a great investor for me still. And, and I think advice for parents is invest in your children because if mom were, if my mom weren't investing in me when I was a kid and even, you know, for Christmas, I would ask for a video camera to make YouTube videos. You know, I would ask for a new computer so I could edit the videos and mom would make it happen for me. And the only reason I'm in social media is because she was investing in her children and what they wanted to do. Um, even though she was one of the moms who made us play sports and I'm happy for that because I, I love sports. Um, but it was just super, super nice to have a mother who was investing in me and my interest. So if you're a parent, then I would say my advice is invest in your children um and believe in them and if you're a kid i would just say don't you know work against the grain don't don't come confide to everybody else and what they're doing that's awesome make and nathan would say oh don't cry mom because that would probably make me cry <laughs> oh god all right well thanks and i'm so glad that you did this book because you have a lot of knowledge at such a young age and you've um just blown it out of the park and had huge success and running a seven figure business at 20 years old it's pretty yeah. cool all right so get the book get nathan's insights get jason p jason's insights um and everybody else and everett back to you wow that was fantastic absolutely fantastic melanie you just got to be so proud I, and yeah, I, I could see a little welling up there yeah. a little bit. You put it together. You're holding it yep. together. This is good. Um, just so, so wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Melanie. Sure. And thank you for sharing him with us. Because and, and every time you share him with everybody, they're like, oh, it's so awesome. You know? And then, oh, I thought this was great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you so much. So, um, all right. Well, this is terrific. We're um, having a blast here. Please do get your uh, get uh, a copy of Authority. Um, and in fact, we set up a website for that, and that is authoritythebook.com, authoritythebook.com. And it's filled with all sorts of things. Um, in fact, we went ahead. In fact, hang on. I'm going to show it real quick. I think I can pull this off. Let's, uh, let's, let's try it. I'll probably break something. Where is the where is the screen share in this tool? It's here somewhere. It's been a bit since I've done it. Oh, that's okay. Oh, there it is. Sorry, we'll get it. Now, now application window. Here we are. Awesome. So a beautiful website that actually John North and his team put together. Um, and if you co go to authoritythebook.com. You can um, get buy links to various places in it. And again, right now, the digital version of the book is 99 cents. That will end very, very shortly. Um, but you can learn more about the book. The book trailer is here. Um, I definitely encourage you to visit the website. Also, 
Um, what we've added uh, is a there's a section here. Let me go to it here. Uh, all the authors are listed here with extended bios, <clears throat> and also a way to reach each of the authors. More importantly, so if there's some inner part of this interview that you really resonate with and you want to learn more about the topic, um, then by all means reach out to them um, through through this page. Uh, and then let me see, I think there was something else down here. Yes, also again, another contact page. So uh, we're just grateful for uh, John North and his team putting this uh, beautiful website uh, together for us. Let me get that out of there, fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna continue to move along with our uh, interviews. And um, I wanna introduce, I, okay, I know it's gonna say, to say a very special person will, is gonna become overused, but the truth is, uh, we're, we work with some very special people. Um, but Kathy Fiok, I want to bring up next. And uh, Kathy has just become um, just a phenomenal resource for all sorts of authors as they move to go from an idea to actually publishing a book, uh, writing the manuscript, and being prepared for uh, the publishing process. She's the business book strategist. She works with professionals and thought leaders uh, around the nation and internationally, those who want to write a book to grow their business. Uh, she started her business in 2014 and since then has helped over 200 professionals become published authors. That is quite an accomplishment. Uh, Kathy, it is so good to see you here. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. And it's great to, uh, it's so exciting to be launching Authority. So, uh, so uh, pleased to be here with you today. Fantastic. So, uh, Kathy is buzzing in from Florida that she, she's test driving Florida right now. That's right. Uh, as to whether she wants to relocate there from Louisville. Don't, uh, but uh, anyhow, so... Kathy, what I want to do is I want to interview you, and then I want to allow you uh, to interview your author, uh, Denise Gable. So, um, Kathy, if you would tell us briefly what what's in your chapter of the book. Uh, and by the way, if you haven't figured this out, you need to get the everyone <laughs> need to get the book if you really want to go deep on each of these things. That's right. That's right. Well, basically, my chapter in the book is about my reinvention, and that's um, really the power of a book is it allows you to move into new space. And uh, before I was a book coach, I was a human resources consultant, speaker, trainer, and uh, loved my work there, but um, was ready for something new, something different. And writing a book allowed me to move into the space. So it's really about my journey uh, and how uh, writing the book gave me the authority to take on this whole new endeavor in my career that has been so exciting. So I talk a little bit about my story, but also about some tips and ideas for what others can do who are interested in growing their businesses or reinventing their careers. All right. So what would you say is one of the best nuggets from your chapter? Something that you really love to get out there for people to implement? Well, I think just understanding the possibility. A lot of times, I don't think people understand the power of a book. I, I often tell my authors that a book is magical, and uh, but you have to write it in order for it to do the magic for you. So it's a matter of uh, writing the book that will take you where you want to go. So one of the most important questions I ask my uh, authors is, what is the work that you love to do? What is your zone of genius? Where would you like to uh, contribute? And that's what you want to write about. So it's it's writing your book strategically that aligns with where you want to go for the next step in, in your career, or your business. Okay, so, and you've, you've helped uh, over 200 authors do this. And I've had the joy of working with a, a fair number of, of your authors who yes. have been just really wonderful. Um, now I want you to look back and if you were to bump into yourself when you were, I don't know, 10 or 12, um, and you had the opportunity to pass on one piece of knowledge, one gold nugget to your 12-year-old self. What would that be? 
I think it's that you can do it. You can write. Um, I didn't really think that I could write because I didn't necessarily get great grades in writing or I, I never had a teacher that said, oh my gosh, you should be a writer. So it's I think it's just kind of fun that I am a, a book coach. I don't particularly like to write. Uh, I don't think I'm a great writer, but I think I am a pretty good communicator. And it's all about harnessing those ideas that you have inside of you and, and getting them out there. So uh, it's the advice is you can do it. Even if you think you can't write, if you can't do whatever, you probably can. It's a matter of mindset and um, having the right cheerleaders around you to help you get there. All right, uh, I think that that is, uh, it is good advice to your younger self, absolutely. Well, Kathy, um, I just wanna personally extend my thanks to you because you were our book shepherd uh, for this project. And uh, for anyone out there to understand the challenge of getting 15 people to get their <laughs> chapters together and get, and you know, within certain guidelines, because we didn't want anyone to be too long or too short. and. Um, all of those things and you did a fantastic job of shepherding all 15 of us um, through this process and i want to thank you for the time that you put in reviewing each other's everybody's content because that's that takes time and and thank you for putting your unique talents to work for the benefit of the book as a oh, whole it was my pleasure all right so um now i'm gonna uh bring denise on board and then i'm gonna let you take it away and interview denise all right. Well, I'm going to introduce the Denise, the Denise Gable. She is an amazing individual and she has an amazing business. So, uh, Denise, tell everybody about why you are the Denise. Because there's only one me. Yeah. And, I, <laughs> and there's only one you. And I remember when I first met you, Kathy, and you've been a tremendous book coach uh, for me and friend. Uh, that's developed along the way. But, you know, when I said I'm the Denise and I said, hi, the Kathy, I honestly believe that people have a unique gift to give. You see my sign, you were created to make a difference. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm the Denise. There's only one me, there's only one you. Yeah, absolutely. So tell everybody a little bit about your chapter in Authority. Well, my chapter is about your authentic power and that you can have a title handed to you that gives you some authority. But more importantly, your authority comes from your own authentic power, owning what you own, using what you own and making sure that you, your whole brand, everything about you is the fill in the blank. It's you. So that's what my chapter is about. How do you find it? How do you find your authentic power? How do you use it? And then how do you speak in it? How do you build a brand around it? I wonder if you would be willing to tell people about how you found your voice for writing, because I think it's a great story. <laughs> well, I started out, you know, I've got a corporate background. I've been a chief innovation officer for credit union industry for the U.S. and Canada. I've been a COO. I've got all this title authority. And so for some reason, even though I said I'm the Denise and I'm unique, I started writing in this like boring corporate executive voice. <laughs> and thankfully, I, I did catch it. But more importantly, Kathy did, gave me a smackdown and said, Denise, I don't want to read a book by some boring executive. I want to read a book. I want to read a chapter by the Denise. Yes. The you. And I was like, oh. And so actually for me, I think I, I'm a pretty good writer, but I think I'm a better speaker. And so I started speaking my book and my chapter. And from there I could make the edits. So I just had to catch myself that I'm not a boring executive. I'm quite capable. I'm very talented, but I was using the wrong voice. And so I think that's what makes me a better expert at using your voice, finding your voice. Yes. So I love that. I love mm -hmm. that. So I'm so glad that uh, we were able to make this happen today. And um, uh, Everett, it's so great that you were able to coordinate all of these people and all of these authors uh, for this uh, for this broadcast. Oh, gosh, I've had a I've had a blast through the whole project. 
It's uh, it's really been super, super fun the whole time. And Denise, I love all the little sticky notes that you have in your copy of Authority. <laughs> hold, hold that up again. I want us all to see that. Yeah. I mean, although I think my chapter is outstanding, I really have learned a whole bunch from my co-authors. And, and you can see by those pink tabs. So it's a um, wonderful collection. Wonderful. Fantastic. Great job, uh, Denise. Just uh, great having you as, uh, as part of this project. So um, now what I'd like to do is switch. Let's see here. What I'm going to do, um, we had some people get up really early in the morning to be part of this broadcast. Um, one of them I'm going to make wait till the very end because, I, well, for, for good reasons, and trust me. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the other one, uh, Christine Robinson, uh, has just been a joy to get to know uh, as part of our uh, mastermind group and overall uh, community. And she's from Australia. She has uh, had to get up ridiculously early um, in order to make the live cast. And she um, brought to the project um, a terrific author, and that's Matt Smith. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce Christine and interview Christine a little bit. And, she, and then let her inter, uh, interview uh, Matt. So, uh, Christine, let's, uh, let's get you in here. There you are. So, Christine, tell us first a little bit about you, and then tell us a little bit about the chapter that you contributed to Authority. Good morning, Everett. And, um, yeah, thank you for welcoming me here and into the project. It's been so exciting um, to do. Sorry about the light reflecting, but you won't see me if I turn it off. And, uh, yeah, the it was so exciting to do, but also to invite um, one of my clients and also a really good friend into now because it is a great opportunity to be able to share your authority in different ways. And to me, authorship is all about sharing your message because as denise just said before there only is one of you and um you know i'm an ex-school teacher and i just know that when you're teaching a subject so many different teachers have the same knowledge have the same training or you know quite not quite the same training but similar training but they all are able to share their message or teach a subject in a different way um, and it's just the same with the, you know, being the authority in what you do. There's only one of you. And it's a bit like um, whether you go to a banquet or a buffet or here in Australia, they call it a smorgasbord, a big table with all of these different foods. And you turned up with your food, your plate, and you didn't put it on there. And it would might have been the most exciting plate, diff, you know, beautiful food that you didn't give other people the opportunity to to taste. Um, and it's so amazing when you do take something along and people ask you for your recipe. And that's the same when you share your authority through through your book, through your written word. I don't like writing either. I love maths. I'm an ex maths teacher. Well, I taught lots of things, but. I love maths and figures and writing has never been my thing. So it's really bizarre that I end up now teaching and coaching other people to to write and uh, write their book. And to me, the joy of it is that so many people, you know, it's something like 88% of the US population want to write a book, but only 2% ever get around to doing it. And so it's being able to help people do just that. And when I introduced Matt, he had his book, you know, on his bookshelf in his um Google Drive for four or five years, and so we were able to to um, bring that together. So for the authority, sorry, did you... <laughs> uh, no, I, I I didn't I actually didn't want to leave one of the points you made about the smorgasbord, um, and because I've never heard that analogy, and it's a terrific it's a terrific way to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, so many people are like, yeah, I, I have nothing to offer. I, there's nothing unique that I have to put out there. Um, or why would people listen to me? Or how can I call myself an expert? When the truth is, is that each person has this unique combination of knowledge and experience that nobody else on the planet shares. Not a single person shares that combination of experience and knowledge. And there is someone out there that is keyed to listen to you, right? They, that you are uniquely equipped to communicate something that somebody needs to know. And they may never get it. 
if they don't get it packaged in the combination of your experience and knowledge. Um, and so that whole idea of the smorgasbord, that's really good. You could you could have this fantastic dish. It's fantastic, maybe, you know, maybe not to everybody, but it's fantastic to somebody and they'll never get it if you don't put it on the on the table. Mm -hmm. That's really good, Christine. Um, Thank you. Oh, all right. I did not mean to interrupt your your uh, where you were headed. I was uh, no, that's I fine. Was, okay. <laughs> all right. So um if there was uh you know do you feel like, is there another nugget that you want to share from, from uh, your chapter? Yeah, um, I mean, in all of the chapters, there's so many nuggets. Uh, but one thing that I really like to share, especially when I'm teaching and, and sharing how to write your book with people, but it's one of the biggest thing is that, you know, in business, we need money. We need money, cash flow into our business. That comes through from sales. It comes through from leads and traffic. So you start with the traffic, get the leads and everything. And right now we're in sales um, 3.0, which is being able to, it's an art form, being able to demonstrate that you're the authority, show your um, the results that you've been able to get and also build relationships and then T for trust, so ART. Being able to show that, um, build that know, like and trust factor throughout the book. I mean, what's more intimate than a book? You can actually hear people talking you can visualize the author when you're reading a chapter or or a full book and um, for me that's where it's all about it's being able to use your book as the front of your i call it the tip of the iceberg and then everything else under the book it's what brings people in you're able to share your why but also with your audience their why what's in it for them why they you know should read the book but also why they, you know, how they can do it too. If you can do it, then they can do it. So um, that's my, that's my nugget really, I guess. I love it. Absolutely. So now, now the question that we've I've been kind of wrapping each one with is if you grab, got a hold of yourself when you were maybe 10, 12, something like that, and you had something you could pass to yourself that would have changed the entire trajectory of your life, what do you think that might have been? <sighs> If you have something, it's a great question and it really makes you think, but I think the biggest thing is if you ever have an idea, you have something in your head, it means that you're able to, you, you can see it, so you'd be able to th carry it through. So I don't know whether it's a quote um, from Napoleon Hill or I used to work for a company that was, um, the founder was W. Clement Stone, who was a great friend of, of Napoleon Hill. And so one of the quotes we got from there is if you can, um, you can see it, you can conceive it, you can believe it and you can achieve it. So Excellent. you can do it. <laughs> Excellent. Fantastic. All right. So um, at this time, what I want to do is bring on Matt, who's been patiently waiting in the wings um, and uh, let you introduce us to Matt and kind of bring some of that story, uh, his story out. So Matt, why don't you come on? Let's do this. And I'm gonna get the heck out of the way. And uh, Christine, you may take it away. Hey Matt, how are you? I'm amazing. Christine, how are you? Yeah. Early morning. I'm fantastic. You know what? I'm just gonna tell everyone, Matt is always amazing. He is the most positive person you will ever, <laughs> ever, 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 ever meet. And he's, he's just amazing. So he, I just want to introduce Matt. I met Matt about, Oh, I, th I can't remember, about six months ago now. Um, he was referred to me as a client. And he's got this book idea in his head. And, you know, when I started talking to Matt and, you know, we met each other, I was just blown away by him. And over the last six months working together, he is the most extraordinary guy. He is the true authority in what he does. Um and so much so, he's got so much going on that I, I just don't know how he does it. So, Matt, let me just, um, you know, it's been a pleasure working with you. And from not having a book for, you know, four or five years, having all these ideas, that within the next sort of month or so, you're going to have five books coming out. Five books. <laughs> oh, maybe a bit, a bit, maybe the next two months. So. Yeah, we should have it at five. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What does authority and authorship mean to you, Matt? Um, yeah, you know, I think uh, uh, what does authority mean? Is that what you're asking? Are the yeah. chapters? Or... 
What does this mean? What does, yeah, what does authority mean in the first place? To be an author, authority? What does oh, that do mean? mean? Yes, authority. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's been a dream come true. I wish I could sit and brag about you and introduce you, Christine, but thank you for everything you've done for me. You have taken me and developed me and coached me in so many different manners. So uh, you are an absolute gem in this world, and I'm, I'm blessed to be in your in your world. But um, definitely uh, being an author is, is, is just definitely a dream of mine to just to be able to tell the story, you know, to for my kids, my family something I talk about in my side of this chapter is, is family first and making sure that they are my priority, but to be able to leave them something that I wish my parents and my parents' parents would have left for me is just a, it's a special thing to be just, just be an author. Yeah. Yeah. That was, it, it's truly amazing to see what you, what you're doing at the moment and what's coming out. So what, um, what do you feel is one of the, the biggest things that you've, um, learned or developed while you're um, going through the process of writing, not only your, your chapter, but also books as well? Um, things that I've, I, uh, I think that I've, I've definitely learned to tell the story. You know, I think that the, 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 you've helped pull out this story in so many different manners. And, and, the, and like everybody here has said that there's such a special, unique story for everybody. And sometimes you don't even realize your own story until you start putting it on paper. And then when you do put it on paper, sometimes I've read my own story. I'm like, wow, that's kind of cool. That was me, you know, but it, it is definitely to be able to tell your story and, and th that everybody has a unique trait and story to tell uh, and, and just putting it on paper. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Let's just go a little bit more into your chapter. Tell us a bit more. Yeah. And no, Family First is such a huge thing for you. So um, if you can delve into that a little bit. Yeah, I think uh, my chapter is really about just staying positive, you know, taking risks, how to balance, you know, the most important things in life. Uh, and to me, uh, finding your why and in, in your life, your home why and your business why and, and really being able to juggle that because that's really the hardest thing. And that's to me, the most important thing in life is family. And I think everybody on this call and I think, you know, everybody in the world at some point, the family is what means the most. But at what cost? Making sure that you don't lose everything else, uh, pushing too hard to to be the most successful, whatever that is. I'm blessed with a, a six-year-old, a five-year-old, and now a two-year-old at home, and they are my pride and joy. Uh, you know, they are my everything. But I've also been able to run over ten different businesses in ten different industries uh, while building real estate and doing so many other things, but making sure that I don't lose focus of my family. So. Uh, that's what my chapter is really about is trying to find that balance and stay positive, still continue to take as many risks as you can, but don't forget the most important thing in life. Yeah, Matt, that's wanna, brilliant. I want to jump in there if you don't mind. As a as a dad and an entrepreneur, um, you, you're you speaking so directly to me. Um, and because I remember a time when I was doing a business transition of trying to close one business down while starting another business up. And you know how it is. You can very easily talk yourself into working ridiculous numbers of hours under the guise of doing it for your family while completely ignoring your family. Right. Um, so what's your, is your, you have a tip, do you have a secret to help people keep the, keep that in perspective? Uh, it's definitely hard. Yeah. Like you are saying right now, I mean, I think the hardest thing is being aware uh, being aware because yes, as an entrepreneur, sometimes you're like, oh, just a couple more hours. This is super important. But making that schedule, making that structure and being aware at, at this time is family time. You're going to have to make up for the rest of that tomorrow and work twice as hard or whatever that is. Making sure you plan out your day from the early mornings to the late evenings, but not compromise ever the time that you need to be there for your kids' first game, uh, your dance recitals, whatever it may be. Don't ever compromise that to try to make a deal. It's not worth it. Yeah, and what, what would, you, would you say is one of the biggest nuggets out of your chapter? Well, I know one, I just want to, oh no, I'll let you, let you speak. No, I want to hear yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you touch on it a bit in that chapter and I keep confusing my, you know, hey, because I've got your, your book that's also coming out. So make right. sure you go get the authority, the authority, the book, um, dot com. go there to get this book. Um, and Matt's got it there. I haven't don't have a copy myself yet. Um, but I know Matt is amazing at bending time. So being able to really make use of little snippets of time that can make so much difference to your work day, your family day, and and just allow you to 
really you know balance both not that you can ever have a balance but as as best you can absolutely yeah and i appreciate that and i think that would definitely be a, a nugget for the chapters just uh you know how to balance that time and how to use those little nip times from standing in a drive through from lunch when somebody's taking a nap when kids are doing something or whenever you can to make sure that you get as productive as you can but put it down when you need to put it down um and I think, you know, the other thing is take risks, you know, make sure that you you jump, you know, just do it. I think that's the hardest thing for entrepreneurs out there that we overthink things sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, and we think, well, what about this? What about that? Like, just just do it. And, and if it comes with the family, make sure you take that time and that risk with the family. But as business, too, like, just don't forget that family is always priority. If you ever have to choose one or the other, choose your family 100 percent of the time. But take risks, jump, jump out of the plane, build, build the parachute on the way down. Awesome. That's one of the best things um, that I've ever heard. So uh, just helps you to, you know, things are going to be okay. Whatever it is that you do, just jump. Uh, thank you for that, Matt. Let me just ask you, what is one thing that you would tell your younger self? Uh, you know, with from the authority standpoint, I, I was thinking about that. And I think definitely learn and continue to learn. I don't be afraid to learn. The, the beautiful thing about authority right here. Is, is I'm such a believer in coaches. Besides Christine, I've got probably four other coaches in my life and I'm trying to learn every single day um, from my health to my businesses to my personal, whatever it is, there's somebody there. And, and this is a beautiful thing. You've got 15 different people to learn from, not just one person and one unique perspective, but so many different things. So learn from many people as possible. Be as open-minded as you possibly can um, in life. You know, don't, don't ever close your mind and think that you know everything because uh, there's there's a nugget from everybody in in the world out there. So from from a personal standpoint, definitely that, uh, or from a professional standpoint, is learn and continue to learn and get as many mentors as you can in your life. Don't be Absolutely. afraid to ask. Absolutely, Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, Matt. It's a pleasure. Um, and yes, I'm your book mentor or coach, but I learn so much from you every day. So thank you. It's it's been, it's been an honor. You're 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 a beautiful soul, and I appreciate you in my life. Thank you. Well, goodness, yep. thank you. You guys are uh, fantastic. And thank you, uh, Matt, for those uh, words of wisdom. Um, I think I should have read your, I think I should have read your chapter about 10 years ago. I think it'd been, uh, been helpful. I think I did a decent job balancing, but there were some definitely some times where I was out of balance. And, uh, yeah. Wow. Um, this is what's so exciting just about this book in general about authority is you're getting perspectives from a 15 uh, experts uh, from around the world, honestly, all coming from it from different avenues, all talking about the value of authority as you build your business and your brand and methods to do it. Um, and I think that is uh, maybe one of the secrets uh, of this book. So please pick up um, authority. The digital versions are all 99 cents during this special launch window. Uh, and of course, you can pick, pick up the paperback. Uh, uh, one of our commenters, Jason Jordan, thank you so much, said absolutely pick up both. I mean, if you're really gung-ho, pick up the paperback, the Kindle, the Nook, and the Kobo. I mean, let's just go for the whole shebang here, right? Uh, I think that would be fantastic. So at this time, what I'd like to do is introduce uh, my friend, Mark Leonard. Uh, Mark is, uh, for one thing, he is an absolute gentleman. Um, I have just had a blast working with him. Um, Mark uh, is recently relocated to the Reno area and gets to dig out of some snow periodically. It's a little bit different than living just north of uh, San Francisco, I think. Uh, Mark has a, B a BA in philosophy and also an MBA from the University of Virginia. 21 year career in high tech in Silicon Valley. Um, after he wrote a book about his investing experiences, he soon found himself in demand as a book coach. It's funny how that sometimes happens. Um, and helping other high-tech professionals write and publish their books. So let me bring on Mark Leonard, who is not just incredibly smart, but incredibly kind. Mark, welcome to the uh, live cast. And thanks for being so patient too. No, it's been an honor and I've been learning from, it's so nice to see people and hear their voices and get their message in in more ways than one. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest thing that has surprised me about moving in out of 
high tech into book coaching and book publishing is that writing and publishing a book can uh, really benefit the author in a variety of different ways. I think some of us, when we get into it, think that, uh, oh yeah, we're going to make a lot of money selling our books. And that's probably on the bottom of the list. It's probably not going to happen for most of us. But the other, the advantages that you can get by becoming an author is to it's just, it's huge. I mean, shorten, in, in, in my chapter, uh, tell some of these stories about shortening the sales cycle, attracting investors, uh, getting uh, speaking engagements, getting new clients, giving yourself a competitive differentiation. How do you stand out in a very competitive environment? It, it can raise your visibility and ultimately you leave, a le when you become an author and, you know, I think Matt touched on a little bit, you leave a legacy um, that uh, that is going to last for you know, potentially generations. So I think that's what's um, uh, what's really uh, interesting. And that's what my chapter is about. That's terrific. Can you share with us, um, it doesn't have to be your best nugget, but one of the gold nuggets that's embedded uh, in your chapter. Well, I'm, I'm going to take an excerpt from it because one of my clients is an invent, inventor and, uh, and, and is a really interesting uh he, he developed a, an idea for a mattress uh, and, and other things that can really help people in their health. And uh, as a result of becoming a published author, he was able to secure a number of speaking engagements with audiences interested in this topic. After one of his talks, a member of the audience came up to meet him and identified himself as a potential investor. Within weeks, they negotiated a significant deal, potentially worth millions of dollars. So uh, that's one of the things that... It, it, that can happen when you are the author of a book. Uh, that's uh, I appreciate that very much. And this is a thing. I think um, a lot of people, they understand that there's a bit of celebrity that comes with having written a book and, and they're, you know, and there abs absolutely is, but the benefits go so much further than that. And that's what I appreciate about, about your chapter and, and, and your contributions there. Um, what is there, uh, you know, go back to your 12 year old self and is there something about authority in general uh, or just business uh, business in general that you would have shared with your 12 year old self that might've changed your uh, trajectory a little bit? Yeah, I would say the, I, the, 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 ba the, the advice that I would give my younger self is develop a deep expertise in one area. I, I don't care if it's mowing, taking care of lawns, being a restaurant owner, being a cook, you know, being a businessman, an inventor, whatever, develop a deep expertise in one subject area and then let the whole world know about that. Um, I, and my advice would be let the whole world know about that by writing a book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because, you know, I think there's a great, you know, we, uh, you see the pendulum swing back and forth sometimes between the value of being a specialist versus a generalist. Right. Um, and so that's interesting. But, you know, the guy who knows the most on the planet about lawn mowing, you know, has a value. Right. E even uh, who, you know, that goes far beyond, you know, what you might perhaps might expect. So that's interesting. Go deep, get develop expertise in one thing. Um, and that's good, too. I remember Brendan Burchard talked about he used this great word picture and he loves word pictures. But he was saying, if you were going to try to light a pile of leaves on fire with a magnifying glass using the sun, you know, if you take that magnifying glass and you keep moving it around, you're not going to light a darn thing on fire. But if you just sit there and camp on one leaf for a while, you're going to light that leaf on fire and it will light all the rest on fire. I think that speaks to your point. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Terrific. Um Mark, uh, would you like me to bring on Alan and let you introduce him at this time? We're yes, please. There. All right, let's do this. So, uh, and by the way, thank you for introducing us to Alan. He has been um, a joy to work with uh, in this uh, in this project. So, I'm going to get out of my way and let you uh, let you introduce uh, uh, Alan for all of us. So. Alan, it's so good to see you, um, and and it's it's very interesting to we're going to learn about your expertise and what the um, uh, and what the changes that have occurred in the past year have in, have just magnified the expertise that you've been developing over the last number of decades. 
um, that we that we're meeting like this, that we are having conversations around the world uh, like this, uh, is just uh, a, a sign of the times that we're in, uh, exacerbated by, but by the uh, by the pandemic. And uh, so let me introduce you a little bit. So Alan um, is a Silicon Valley uh, professional. He is a streaming media expert, entrepreneur, commentator, and advisor to global digital media companies, uh, and founder and chief executive of the San Francisco-based Podem Media Group, P-A-D-E-M Media Group. Uh, it's a media technology and uh, market advancement consulting practice. Now, uh, Alan has devoted uh, 25 plus years to the global growth of the digital realm in streaming media. I mean, before it was really a term, uh, education, AI, and digital intelligence connected devices has provided him extensive insight, especially now gained through engagements with extraordinary companies, uh, extraordinary inventors, scientists, technologists, and accomplished executives in high performing companies. So, Alan, welcome. Mm, thank you for having me. And first of all, thank you for having me a part of this, this group. As you mentioned and Everett mentioned, you know, I've been keeping notes as well on some of the key insights and, and gems of conversational points that have been said. And thank you. It's very nice to be here. So tell us what your chapter is about. Well, you know, Everett kind of kicked it off a little bit when he said that with the micro with the um magnifying glass to be able to focus on one thing until there's a, per, uh, a certain amount of uh, heat and all, you know, uh, light the uh, leaves. Um, there's a two parts to that is one is focusing on it <laughs> and then lighting it. And then what do you do? Um, my, my part of the, the book and the authority is really kind of focusing on all the aspects of your life and really bringing forward every one of those stages and insights to allow for building out an overall um, way of telling your story, of having that kind of message and experience um, be brought to your audience. And that's what it's really all about, is recognizing and harnessing the power of your collaboration and insight. That's what my, my um, chapter's really mostly about. Um, through that experience, through those processes, through those challenges and trials, um, recognizing what they are. And we have the opportunity to then communicate them to others. My chapter has multiple areas that are addressing um, these kinds of um, insights and opportunities I've had throughout my career. Great, thank you, Alan. And uh, you have a book coming out, right? I do have a book coming out. You do. <laughs> it's, it's really kind of it's really kind of an encapsulation of all of this. It was it was interesting to go through the exercise with you, and thank you, Mark, for including me and Everett and Kathy and Denise and Melanie. Um, this has been one of those situations where, um, when I first met Mark um, through another author uh, that's in the market. Um, you know, we had a chat, a chat, and we were going through a number of different ways of looking at what it could might be. Um, and he said, you know, just a second here. You know, you have more than one book. You have multiple books because of being able to share what you've experienced. And, you know, we all think that, right? But let me tell you, writing a book <laughs> is actually incredibly challenging. It's not like someone says, hey, I'm writing a book. Um you know, there's a process. There are rat holes you can go down into. You can drill. And that's what I've learned in the new book that I've been pulling together with Mark's guidance and Mark's assistance, and that is being focused on connected intelligence and how the intelligence in today's marketplace, particularly with COVID, uh, the impact that we've had. Um, just a nugget a little bit from what Matt had mentioned, too, before um, when it came to social networks is that we've evolved as, as a culture, global culture and society more in the last 11 months than we have in the last 11 years. Yes, I've been a part of this evolution for many years. First CD-ROM game with Lion King, first on-demand service and streaming service around the world. But while those have been evolutionary processes, 
the last 10 months, 11 months, what we have all gone through and shared has had greater impact. And so these kind of communications and connections that we've got plays into um, this discussion of having your voice and finding your voice being a thought leader. And thought leadership is really what echoes being an authority. So what would, uh, what would be the uh, one piece of advice you would give your younger self, say when you were starting out back in your early 20s, uh, that uh, you would give yourself now if, if given the chance? Well, wake up. You know, that would have been back in my 20s. But about, it, about during that time in, in uh, my university days, um, it really comes down with patience. Patience with yourself and patience with others. Um, you know, a lot of times during the course of it is like you, you run the game of, hey, you're out ahead. Try to keep up with me. And in this particular case, probably the greatest gem of advice that I, I've really learned that I would tell myself is patience. Also, probably pull together, you know, a, a, a plan um, and not be afraid of failure. You're going to fail, pal. You know, and, and this is one of those situations where, you know, you have to look at the fact of, okay, you, you fail, but you fail in an area of focus that you really love. I just happened to get involved many years ago, and the book actually gives the date and time. The, the, the fact of it is, is that I, fo I, I found media. I found media psychology and media ecology and the impact of what we're doing right now, uh, video engagement, virtual worlds. I worked with Steven Spielberg in putting together one of the first 3D multi-user virtual environments um, in the world called Worlds. You know, and, and in that process, how you interact with others. And that's what I tell myself. I tell myself, patience, young man. Um, you're going to be out ahead. You're going to need to have a focus. But mostly, stay true to who and what your interests are. And that's what I have done throughout this entire process. And here we are today. We're today with COVID and the impact and the virtuality of what we're dealing with right now and who we're talking to, all of, all of the audience as well as to you, Mark. And that is um, the impact that we have as individuals. And that's what I would share. And, you know, I, I want to I wanna come back to a little bit of a sports um, metaphor, and that is Michael Jordan said something a long time ago that was really made an impact on me, surprisingly, at the time. And that was talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence wins championships. And that little gem of instead of being that leader out in front and having that ego um, vanity reward, finding teams and putting teams together and having them, everyone win is what I really share in my chapter within the book. Terrific. Alan, it's great. And uh, thank you for being here. And uh, Everett, sure. back to you. I don't know that I want to interrupt any of that. My goodness. Um, <laughs> and that's a fantastic quote. I know I got it wrong, but I put it in the stream right over the top of my mouth. Uh, but anyway, talent wins games. But it was teamwork and something else wins championships. What was it? Um, yes. Well, basically, talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence and intelligence wins championships. Wins championships. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Well, Mark and Alan, thank you both for being part of the Authority Project and adding to it. I think the two of you raised the uh, intelligence quotient in the group substantially. <laughs> So I appreciate that. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much. To, uh, all right. So um, uh, our, our last guest uh, uh, had, uh, got up early as well. In fact, he got up very early. And he's been not only waiting to speak, but he's uh, had um, this whole thing, this whole event streaming for us on uh, the uh, latest uh, social media platform. And uh, I am going to bring on uh, John North uh, from Australia. And John has been, uh, I mean, just instrumental in this project. Uh, his team did the website. His team um, did the layout. His team did uh, graphics. His team did just all sorts of things. And I'm really uh, grateful. But first, I guess I need to give John his proper um, introduction because, you know, that's what you do. 
Um, so John is the CEO and founder of EvolvePreneur.app. Uh, uh, he's a podcast host. He's a seven-time number one best-selling author. He's also a hybrid book publisher and a strategic marketer. Um, he's been helping entrepreneurs uh, create books, products, and marketing strategies for over 25 years, okay? And has personally generated over $25 million in sales. John is uh, perhaps the smartest person I know, and um, he's uh, been just a great partner and a great one to work alongside. John, come join the show finally. You've been so patient. <laughs> yeah, you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I saved you for last intentionally. Yes. Um, uh, first, I knew you couldn't go anywhere because uh, the other streaming you were doing. No, actually, that's not why. Uh, but because I knew we would probably want to take a little bit more time to talk about uh, about your chapter and also talk about the book launch and what we're uh, what we're creating here. So, um, John, if you would, first, let's go through the uh, kind of the standard questions. Tell us first a bit about your chapter uh, and what we can glean from it. And it was interesting because um, there's a lot of book publishers in here. So basically, uh, we, we wanted to focus on some more of the mechanics of things. So I think as a time poor, typically underfunded in online entrepreneur who receives much conflicting advice, the best way to grow up on how to grow a business, how do you compete with the big end of town without having the resources that they have at your disposal? So I think that's kind of um, the, the sort of way that we want to talk about in the book is how you get there. And how we got there in our experience. So that's essentially the what the chapter is about. But it's also about a lot of other things. It's almost like a checklist of what you should really be doing in terms of online. Yeah, and um, John, by the way, thank you. You're streaming this on Clubhouse right now. You've been mm -hmm. streaming it now for uh, hour and twenty minutes or something like that. Um, John, you are all about leveraging technology. Um, mm -hmm. You are about creating systems. Um, uh, <laughs> For those watching, just yesterday, John, I just happened, um, I happened to, to discover that John's uh, podcast, uh, the Evolvepreneur podcast, was on IMDb, and each of the ho each of the people that he's interviewed now have IMDb listings, including uh, including myself. And so it was really funny. I was looking at it, going, "What the heck? How's this happened?" And John's like, "Oh yeah, I've been fiddling with IMDb and." fine tuning and all of that. And I just said, John, where do you find time in the day? And his answer was like, I said, do you ever sleep? Right. That's what I asked John. I asked him if he ever slept. And um, he said, he goes, yeah, he goes, I only work a, a 40 hour week. In fact, actually he goes, I work less than that. Cause I make sure to go play squash four days a week. And I think you tar you said it's systems, it's planning, it's teams, uh, and it's certainly certainly technology as uh, as part of that. And you continue to to uh, blow us away. What's one of the best nuggets you feel like you can share from uh, from your chapter? Thanks, Edward. And I think it's interesting when you you think about um, a lot of different things. Like we see a lot of different marketing and a lot of different avenues. And one of the things that I think people need to remember is, and I saw this great comment, and I just put it in my book, was that. Social media is like renting an apartment, right? It's it's a nice and it's clean and fancy, but it's not really yours. And I think the danger in, in the world now is that people got very aligned on social media, got very aligned on their likes and their followers and stuff like that, which could easily be taken away tomorrow. And I think not building your business as a platform and, and actually building your business in a, a way that you have control of that I found that it cost me a million dollars in the early days when I had my own business and we we're doing distribution company and I ended up in a situation where I actually didn't own anything. So when we were actually no longer distributed, I lost all the clients, everything had to start all over again. And it made me understand that you need to own your own stuff. And we realized we were renting, not owning. And we lost, you know, lost millions of dollars out of it. So I think the danger is, and particularly the younger people coming through, they'll just not bother with a website, they won't bother with anything else, they'll just have a, have a Facebook page. And it's so easy to lose that asset. Um, case in point, uh, right now, they're, but I'll just hub up about Clubhouse, right? Mm -hmm. And how uh, suddenly you're seeing everybody jumping into Clubhouse. Well, okay, it's the latest, greatest, and will it be here next year? Uh, you know, will it be here in six months? Who knows, right? It's just like when Google Plus came out and 
uh, all sorts of things. You have these tools. However, eventually a new one sticks. And mm -hmm. eventually the audience that you thought you had in Facebook is now someplace else. And you find yourself having to build it again. Um, mm -hmm. Or you get delisted, right? Mm -hmm. Facebook decides that they don't like something you're saying or whatever. They decide to delist you. Um, so your audience, either, either, either your audience leaves or the platform leaves you, right? Yeah. Uh, that, those are, those are the well, I got locked out twice last year. In 2020, I think I got locked out of Facebook twice, once for three weeks, and still oh. to this day don't know why. Luckily, I have a backup profile that I could get myself back in again. But I realised that, you know, like I was locked out. And not only that, all my agency accounts and all my clients were locked out too because I couldn't get in and do anything. So I was completely shut down. Um, so if I hadn't had a backup, I would have, you know, I would have been doomed. It wouldn't be able to turn off ad accounts or do anything. Yeah, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty terrifying, uh, mm. honestly. And, and we've seen it, uh, we've seen it too many times. So um, there is a lesson there, right? You've got to move your audience out of social media. It's good that they're in social media and that you're interacting mm. with them there, but you've got to move them someplace else. You've got yep. to move them into your website, into your environment, into your email list, into uh, into your world where you completely control access. Um, and yet, I laugh a bit about that. Even though we have there have people on e on an email list, all it takes is for uh, SendGrid or uh, somebody else to decide that they don't want to deliver your emails. I guess there's always that risk, but it certainly you have a lot greater control there. And, and yeah, and that's right. Yeah, and I think the thing is, control is the key, right? Owning your own stuff, having control, and and having gone through this with clients over the last few years, what I realised was that the biggest problem. I've, I've, there's two big words, two words that I reckon I found, and actually, just there's a question about who the hell is IMDb? IMDb is actually owned by Amazon. It's actually Amazon. I think they bought it from them or something along the way, but it's a, it's a database of everything about movies and everything. So I'll be sitting here in Netflix watching this movie. I'm wondering what this actress is or the actor's done, right? And I can go to IMDb, it's my, it's my Google for, for everything, go in there, find the actor, find out what they've been involved in and actually go through that whole searching process without having to actually delve, delve into anything else. So it's a really cool app. Um, and obviously it's credibility being listed in IMDb, like anything we're talking about authority. Well, Amazon's listing you and then Amazon's currently now also doing Amazon Music, which has actually added podcasting. So there's now you can actually listen to podcasts on Amazon. So getting across all those platforms and having that credibility is important um, and not that hard if you know, you know, if you've done the research and figured out how to do it. But it's, yeah, it's interesting. So I think what we had as a problem with what I did is I couldn't uh, figure out two things. One is big tech. So we're now facing a thing called big tech, which means that they've basically taken all the data they really want now and then they pull the ladder up behind them. And now they're saying to people, well, you can't have that data anymore because the government's now mandated we can't do that and all this sort of stuff. So funny how that's going to fell into place, right? And so now you've got this situation where there's no real access to the big data and now you've got this fight between Apple and Facebook saying, Apple saying, we want privacy, we're not going to let you do all this information that Facebook gets. And the other one to me is the tech stack. And this is something I learned along the way when I was looking into particularly membership systems where you've got a situation where someone will have maybe 10 actual solutions that they actually use to make their system work. And that's crazy, right? It, you know, when you think about it, having 10 different software applications that run one business, and that's where we sort of developed the Evolpreneur app around that because we felt that you need just one ring to rule them all, not all these multiple um, solutions trying to tie them together. And so that's the frustration that I found from trying to do client work, ended up having to write actually write our own platform. And the platform then means that you own your own customer at, at the end of the day as well. Um, so, John, um, if you were to get a hold of yourself, uh, you know, when you were uh, a teenager or something, what piece of wisdom would you pass to yourself then? And, and, and it's funny because I asked this question full knowing that your son, mm. James, mm. works alongside you. and mm. um, And has learned a ton of the things that you have learned alongside you, which is, uh, I, as far as I'm concerned, is a dad, a unique joy. Mm -hmm. um, none, of, none of my kids have really uh, had any affinity for this crazy stuff that I do. But, yeah. Uh, so, and I was scared that he wasn't going to either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. 
Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who is probably the most accomplished orthodontist within 100 miles of my of me. He's got a very well-oiled practice, very prominent. They just have everything dialed, dialed, dialed. And, it, and I said, is your son going to become an orthodontist? Because he could just walk right into this mm. amazing business. Mm. He said, no. He said, he won't. I'm like, why not? He says, because well, mm. he sees the hours I work. Mm. He, sees, he sees me go to work. He sees me then after I get home from work, have dinner with the family and then go work a few more hours. And he says, there's no way I want that. <laughs> um, so it's very interesting, you know, what we teach our kids. Um, just it's through what they're watching, work. right? It's what they're soaking up. It's not what you think they see because they're yeah. soaking up everything, and they're not. And, and you're doing stuff like, as you say, like they see you working these long hours and getting stressed and frustrated, and they, they don't want to be like that. Yeah, and so, yeah. That. I'm yeah, exactly. that, right? That's what it'll be. Yeah, yeah. The, there, there was a, a parenting uh, Bible study that we used to uh, teach, and one of the phrases that came out of that is "more is caught than taught." And, uh, and that's true. And it totally goes back to uh, what our uh, dad, our serial dadpreneur was uh, talking about. Uh, yeah, talking about yeah. earlier. All right. So I totally cut you off. But what, yeah, you what's did. what <laughs> you ask yourself as a kid? And, and that's an interesting question because um, I think originally we spoke about what your younger self was. And so I, I kind of thought about when I was starting my business back in, when I was like 25, 28, I think it was about 27 or 28 when I actually went into business. So one of the things that, happened to me was I left school when 15. I finished um, grade 10 in Australia. It's it's like pre, it's like high school, but it's a little bit. And then I moved on to, um, got a work job in a bank and I worked at that bank for 11, 11 years. And I learned a lot, but what I, I read a book, I think, or I actually went to Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, Robert Kiyosaki, and he said a very interesting thing was that wages is a living, business is wealth. And I started my own little business on the side probably around when I was about 21, 22, something like that. And you see that nowadays that people start like I was, uh, there was one on earlier where he started when he was 13, right? So I think starting earlier would have been good, but I think without the knowledge and the experience that I would have done, I think 11 years, maybe I should have cut it after six or seven, but at the end of the day, I learned so much. I don't really think I could have sped that up. But one of the things I did with my son then was as an, I wanted to make him, make him an entrepreneur, not a worker. Right, not someone who just works for someone that actually can actually become an entrepreneur. So I think that's the trick is to actually think like an entrepreneur, not think like you've got to work in the same job or whatever for 20 years. And so I think that's a danger. Um, and obviously you've got to suit the right person too. So some people are better suited to, to have a job, some people aren't. And so I actually said to him, oh, yeah, try try it for a couple of weeks, um, couple of weeks on part-time, see how you go. And if you don't like it, go to university instead. Um, and then three years later, he's work. He started straight out of school. Three years later, he's um, 21 now. Um, he's been working for me, so I guess he's not going anywhere t anytime soon. <laughs> it's funny. Um, my uh, youngest son uh, over the summer uh, took a job with my brother. My brother uh, is an attorney. He's got a law office, and he offered my son a job, just basically working in the mailroom. And uh, and he told him. He said. He said. He said, Kyle. He said, this job, you're, um, you may decide that you don't like this job. You may very quickly learn that this is uh, uh, something you don't want to do. And that's the value of it, too. Not only are you going to earn some money, but maybe you're going to learn what you don't want to do uh, mm -hmm. in the future, what kind of job you don't want to have. Mm -hmm. And sure, sure enough, uh, that, that was uh, definitely the lesson, uh, the lesson that was learned, you know, and in a way that he could have never been taught. He just he had to experience. To decide, hmm, I don't know, I'm not sure if I like that particular, you know, that kind of a, a job. So, yeah, and I um, think the legacy thing yeah. is, is interesting. Like with with most business owners and most entrepreneurs now, they don't think about the future. They don't think about what's going to happen in their business when they retire. And most of the time, most businesses actually stop when they're, um, you know, when they get sick or are they they too too old to work anymore and stuff like that. So it's almost like a shock, right? And the reality, it's been coming for a long time. It's just. A, and so to me, I had to make a decision about legacy. So you, do you create a legacy business or do you create a business you're going to sell? So that's yeah. why I decided I looked at book publishing and I looked at the, the software development and the platform and thought, well, reoccurring income is king. And that's one of my specialties is reoccurring income. And it's very difficult to get reoccurring income in book publishing necessarily, but there's, but selling a platform and that's an ongoing thing. So the entire right. mindset of the way we're building the business is based on that legacy and that goal 
and that could be like 15 years, 10, 10, 15 years down the track even, but that's a whole different pivot to think about as opposed to having to think, okay, well, I'm just going to keep going until I drop and then I'll worry about it then, right? Don't worry about it then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I have to say there was some real value, you know, in uh, I think was it Matt who said, you know, build your parachute on the way down. Mm. Um there, there is a lot of value in that. I think as entrepreneurs, honestly, I don't think any of us would have been sex, successful if we took time to build the parachute before we ever jumped out of the plane. Um, we'd have just never jumped. We'd have just mm. spent all this time in preparation and, and not, not action. Mm. Bringing, bringing this back to the subject of authority, yep. um, you know, uh, obviously books have featured uh, a big part of this because so, so many of us are connected through books. We're either publishers or writers or ourselves or both. Um, in, in my chapter, I really focused on the force multiplier. The book is a force multiplier. Um, and uh, it was funny, in, in one of my books, The Power of the Published, I devoted a whole chapter to the force multiplier. And it was started out with talking about uh, the Maxim machine gun and uh, the impact it had in World War One, completely mm -hmm. changing the nature of warfare because mm -hmm. one person or two people running this machine gun could have the impact of more than a hundred. And that's what a book is, right? A book has this one thing, but it is so powerful and far reaching and helps in so many different ways. Um, I loved it that um, uh, we had talked about uh, shortening the sales cycle, talked about bringing on more clients. Like I was thinking about what Mark uh, was talking about. Um, and and I like what you're talking about as far as systems and technology and recurring, because you're like, what are you going to translate that authority into? Mm. Where, what's, what's the landing place for that authority? You know, it's great to develop the authority, but what will happen? You know, where is it going to, where is it going? What will you do with it? And yeah. I think that that's, um, I think that's very powerful. Interesting, really, that we started your book with it, right? You were the first chapter of the book, which is not why I made you the last interview, by the way. <laughs> right. but you were the first chapter in the book um, and, and started people off really thinking that way, right? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with it once you've got it? So mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate that. Um, so I, to kind of wrap up this interview, um, just to reward those people who, are, who have been, who, who watched to the end, right? Um, all two of you. Uh, maybe, however, you know, maybe on the read tip. I don't know. Facebook uh, lies, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's all, it's all about the replay. Um, mm -hmm. But let's talk a little bit about what we're doing with this launch because mm -hmm. um, this is uh, the first time that uh, most of us in the group have been involved with uh, a Wall Street Journal launch. And uh, I don't know, John, I, I don't know what your number is. Like we've have, we've done 70 plus uh, number one, you know, Amazon launches. I know you've done a ton. Um, like 1,500, I think. 1,500, I think, I've been involved in or something. So Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, because the software you've created mm. for tracking and, and research um, mm. has been involved in GADs, right? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> so what do, you see as, uh, what do you see as really the value of this one in reaching beyond Amazon and heading towards Wall Street Journal, knowing that, the Wall Street Journal and USA Today push is not right for mm. a high percentage of our authors, mainly mm. because of the resources it takes to invest. Yes. What, do you see as, what do you see as different? And really, what's the purpose behind going for Wall Street Journal and USA Today? I think it's a, it takes you to that next level. So I think, um, and it seems that in some situations, you know, like Amazon is one sort of level, but then when you get to Wall Street Journal and 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 those and and USA Today, you're actually at a much higher level of of um, of status. And and the fact that you get to use those logos, obviously, and I think that's really the key to it is that it's about collecting that kind of credibility as you go along the way. And I think you know fun, something funny, you know, I see, and I've got a couple of clients this way, and we actually make them do this is we make them create a blog article for every time they actually appear in media, because they you ask them and they go, where did you where's this photo of you doing whatever? And they go, oh, I've lost it now. And so what happens is they end up losing all their media that they've done and they can't remember where they went and what they did. Half the time I do podcast interviews and I can't remember, you know, I can't remember which one it was when, when that's coming out. But if I create a blog post for every time I do something in there, at least I've got a record of it then and I can actually build my credibility and build my authority. 
So in some respects, it is like collecting, you know, your your um, your cards or whatever. But the reality is that most people don't do that. They don't actually keep track of it. And I think that's the part of the key to this is, yes, look for authority, but also keep track of what's going on. Create a blog article or something that actually keeps that record forever and build that, right? Gosh, John, that is genius. And I think this is the thing. It's, it's so wonderful, but also frustrating. The most incredible discoveries are often incredibly simple. Mm. And what you just described um, is really valuable because you're right. I, I think, yeah, where where is that picture? When mm. did I do that? What mm. did I say then? What was, what's the takeaway? Uh, yeah. Even just from the standpoint of a journal, you know, mm. of, of being able to look back and see those accomplishments. Mm. Uh, um, I think that's terrific because the blog post you want you want to trumpet these things out there publicly anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, as another point of exposure. Um, and what a terrific brag rag per se to be mm. able to do that. You know, I was thinking of Wall Street Journal and USA Today is kind of like this. It's like uh, I was in Boy Scouts, and you've got all the different ranks, you know. And I can't even remember where it begins if it begins at Tenderfoot or whatever. But I know what the top is, right? I think the, the Scouts one night and that was it for me. <laughs> I couldn't tie any ropes. <laughs> there you go. So, but the top is Eagle Scout, right? The top is Eagle Scout, and very, very few people get to Eagle Scout. Um, I got to Life, which is the rank just under um, under that. But anyone who's not in scouting has never heard of a Life Scout. No, right? <laughs> what the heck is that? I don't know what that is. Does um, that mean you live in? The, if you go to get lost in the jungle, you'll live. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe that's a good question. Um, but you know, so the irony here being though, is that you don't, anyone outside of scouting doesn't know what life scout is because mm -hmm. it's just, it's not the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyhow, I, I, yeah, I think that you're right. Uh, very, very few people reach the wall street journal journal and USA today level. And that's not the top level, right? There's still New not York times top. sitting above it. Yeah. Um, yeah. but, uh, but this is great. I mean, we're, uh, I'm really excited to see the results of it. You and I were talking uh, yesterday about the crazy number of sales that happened uh, uh, that have happened so far, mm -hmm. and and that was even before today's push. So we'll see. Yeah, we where, got to get the top one hundred there for a minute, and then sort of went back again. So we got to push it back up. Like it was just like yeah, a little. Well, and that's, and that, yeah. yeah, and that's totally fine. And for any of you watching who are familiar at all with the Amazon launches and how different this is, you know, the Amazon launch is about creating this one-time spike on one day. Mm. Um, and making it as steep and as tall as you can make it. Whereas USA Today and Wall Street Journal count sales not on a day or on a few hours time, but over a, a week's time. And they don't just count them on Amazon, they count them on multiple outlets. Mm. And so it is a different beast uh, entirely, but so, so excited to see, yeah, um, yeah. see how it plays out. Be fantastic. Well, and I think it's a great way to... Um kind of start the year, right? So we're starting the year off with a sort of strength and saying, okay, now we can we can say, yep, yeah, tick got that one done and uh, go from there. So Yeah, it wasn't what we planned, right? No. Uh, <laughs> we planned to end the year with it, but uh, that's okay. It's, um, I think it's come when it needs to come, right? I, I think what happened to me when I look back at my life and when I, like, I worked at the bank and did all these different things, things come along when they need to come along. And I think trying to push something like we, I, I was talking to you about it and you were getting very stressed about the fact we couldn't do it. And I'm going, well, the end of the day, you know, like it will happen when it happens. And so it's probably better that we start the year off than finish the year. I think in some respects it gives you that surge of energy that you probably would have spent over the Christmas pudding, right? So I think at the end of the day, I think having this kind of start the year off fresh and with a new thing, it's probably what it was meant to be. Maybe Barnes & Noble deliberately got hacked just for us, right? You know, well, actually, you're the tech guy. Maybe you hacked them, right? You know, yeah, well, you never know. Right? <laughs> you didn't have to delay, John. You didn't have to take down, you know. Take, you wouldn't uh, take my course. <laughs> um. Yeah, you know, and you're right about it. I, and as the person who was kind of in charge of making sure this thing kept moving forward, I felt a great sense of obligation to, you know, all of the authors. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't want to let them down as far as their expectations for launch. Um, that being said, everybody everybody was so kind. They could have pressured, mm -hmm. right? They could have been, where is this? I need it out, you know? And everyone was very, very kind. Um, and 
I, and I got to tell you, um, I just had a really fantastic two week vacation and mm -hmm. I was able to come into this launch really fresh instead of had we done it in October, I was in the midst of all sorts of things. Yeah. And you were so, in time. So one of the things that we haven't done right is we actually haven't talked about your chapter. And, oh, and, gosh. Well, yeah. I just snuck it in. I, mean, yeah. I snuck it in periodically throughout. That's I know. That's so, so I think the only thing that we probably didn't cover out, outside the fact that, um, you know, obviously your chapter's about authority and stuff like that is, is what would you tell your younger self ultimately? Um, yeah. And, and yeah, that's always a tricky one, right? It's actually, you know, it, it's actually super easy because, you know, it's a question I've been asked before and been given a chance to think about it. Um, as you may know, I discovered masterminds pretty late in the game mm. uh, and uh, wish I had discovered those much, much earlier. Um, so for anyone watching, we have a mastermind group called the Business Accelerator Group. And um, uh, every one of us in there are uh, best-selling authors and mm. a lot of us are involved in publishing. Um, but discovering the value of mastermind groups is something I wish I had known earlier, you know, mm -hmm. and as a 12 year old, it doesn't look like it does, you know, like it would for now, but mm -hmm. you know, as a 12 year old, maybe that's a study group of some kind. Um, yeah. I think it has different forms, right? It, it does. And, you know, but we think of a study group as, okay, a bunch of kids that are, you know, you're trying to learn a particularly difficult topic. So let's get together and study together. We're, Whereas the real value would have been a group of a group of peers mm. who are willing to open up and discuss all sorts of topics, not just algebra, mm. and um, and can can lead with the uh, successes and the failures that they've had, so that we can all learn from mm. each other's successes and failures. Um, I wish I had discovered mastermind group groups earlier. Um, I don't know what that would have looked like if you told me about them when I was in, you know, junior high or high school. Um, mm -hmm. I probably would have said, hey, thanks, and gone on and did my own thing anyway. But <laughs> but um, I absolutely value them now. And it's 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 something that if someone comes to me and they say, hey, what's one business lesson I need to take away? What's the one thing you wish you would have learned in business early on? Mm -hmm. Holy cow. Get in a mastermind group. If you can't find one, create one mm -hmm. and and not just one, you know, uh, you know, the there, there's room in your life for for more. So and that's and that's why I mean, John, I, I think of I think of the trajectory of my business uh, over the last five years, uh, the last seven years, I can attribute the growth to the relationships and knowledge that have come out of masterminding. I mean, that's a really interesting thing there, right, is that most of the people, like you said, were in publishing in the group, right? So technically you're competitors. Yeah. And I've never, I always reckon there's plenty for everyone, right? And I think getting, you know, getting your competitors closer to you is not a bad thing. Um, but most industries are not like that. When I know I was in new accounting software, they used to sit, um, there used to actually be like three Australian software companies in the same street, almost across the road from each other. So what they'd do is they'd sit outside and they'd watch the courier come out to send me packages they were shipping, all right? And they'd count them and, and they'd bag each other out in, in the ads, you know, like they could pair each other and all this sort of stuff. There's no way those guys were ever going to be in a mastermind. But you can imagine that three very powerful software companies actually got talking what could have been done. But no, they want to, you know, try and kill each other off. And one guy was particularly aggressive. Um, and, and so you look at it and you think, well, gee, what would a mastermind look like in that situation? And so some industries just don't, they get so wrapped up in this whole competitive thing. And, and the reality is every publisher, particularly with hybrid publishing, your personality has a lot to do with the client you pick up. Yeah. And so you can't just say, oh, well, that, uh, that person stole that customer off me because the reality is they're probably never going to be your customer anyway. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, I totally, uh, just second what you just said. Um, you know, we are, you know, that is funny because most of us are competitors of a kind with each other, mm -hmm. but we never, we very rarely have the opportunity to step on each other's toes. Part of it's mm -hmm. because what we do, you know, bringing books to market, you know, it's not like you bring a, you know, like at least for my company, I'm not bringing a thousand books to market in, a, you know, in a year. No, you know, if, if kill you. Bring, <laughs> yeah, kill me. Yeah, well, yeah. If we bring thirty in, 
you know, 30 mm -hmm. or 40, that's pretty good uh, mm -hmm. for the scale we, we want to run in. So, and we're all in different locales, but of course, digitally, we're all everywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's really the case. So, uh, but learning from your competition, on the other hand, I'm, I'm really glad, at least I hope that Alphabet and Amazon are not in the same mastermind group together, right? You know, uh, <laughs> like, there's, there's some things so I do, want, <laughs> I do want them competing with each other, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, and I think that's the danger is that, you know, there's a there's an anti-competition and in Australia, there's all, and as you've got something in America, there's all this anti-competition where you can't collude. Um, and it's really funny because the company that actually uh, wiped me out in the end with as a distributor, I actually went off the anti uh, the, uh, the uh, we call ATSIC here and off the rules. And I said, you guys, congratulations. You've actually done the 11 things you're not allowed to do to people, to me. <laughs> right? Congratulations. You've achieved all 11 of them. <laughs> and it's like, you know, and so if they were colluding with, with competitors, I would have been doomed. <laughs> Funny. Now, um, I turned Christine's camera on before she was ready. I'm sorry, Christine. Sorry. <laughs> um, so she's walking through the house looking for light. Mark and Alan, if you guys want in, I'll uh, add you back in. Uh, we're just going to just wrap up with a little bit of casual conversation, I think, here. If you guys want in, you're in. If not, it's fine. Um, but uh, let's, uh, all right, Mark, you're coming in. That's great. Um, Christine's finding or repositioning things. Yeah, that's what happens when you turn cameras back on people when they're Computer's about to die. Alan add in there too, if you like. Uh, let me see, can I do a side by side like that? Oh, actually that works pretty darn well. Oh, that's great. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it's frightening. And they're back. Um, it was funny, we were one time doing a big live cast, we were doing it on Zoom and you know, Zoom lets you do a ton more cameras and all that fun stuff. And in the midst of the live cast, this gal stands up and takes her top off. And uh, now she had her sports bra on underneath, um, but it was a bit of a distraction, as you can imagine. Um, and I, to this day, don't know if she didn't know she was on camera or she just went, I've got my sports bra on, it's no big deal. You know, I just really don't know. But I should have taken that lesson. I've seen yeah. one where someone actually went to the toilet and put the computer on the floor and they're sitting there no. oh, having no. a week. No. <laughs> I've done that myself, but I made sure I'm on mute and the camera's oh, on. Gosh. Yeah. People well, change the names of Skype and Zoom, right? They actually kids come and play around, they change the names, oh. and they actually the name that pops up isn't the name that you think you're supposed to find. So, yeah, there you go. Mm. Well, I just want to bring uh, bring you guys back in as we kind of wrap up uh, the conversation here. Um, is there anything that you guys want to add as we were kind of just talking about, about authority and not just land, getting the authority, but then landing it and, and using it? Um, I, I, I think, I mean, Alan, you've got such unique experience. Um, and by the way, I was loving looking at your background. Uh, what appeared to be first a collection of snow globes, but I'm not sure that's what they are. And then and, the your, yeah. and then all the cell phones, right? All the Blackberries and stuff back there. It's like you've got your own little um, new tech museum back there. <laughs> well, um, it, that's behind me. If we moved over to the other side, Mark's been in my office. Um, you know, there's the original Macs. There's the original Next Next computers. There's, you know, all kinds of different software that's, that I've uh, built or uh, created. But... You're right about the uh, the snow globes. Um, those um, that are down there are just a few of a collection of about 535 um, snow globes, and it's a it's a it's a study of um, cultural shifts. Um, so it starts in the 50 1950s, and it rolls through. And there's globes from. Um, every country in the world um, and mostly cities of the cities that I've been to that I've participated or uh, been involved in different situations. So it's, uh, um, you know, just I'll grab that one. 550. It, it, it's amazing because I think my thought when I was, was looking at all those would be different to most people's here and it's like, I would hate to have uh, yours would be the same as mine, Jim. Probably I would hate to have to dust all of those. Oh my gosh! 
<laughs> yeah, I'm just scanning, I'm just scanning these. Um, I know I have a few of them. I don't know where they're at, but the World Trade Center, right? And the World Trade Center brings it back. But um, you know, there's some that are from the late '50s that have the family sitting in front of the television. You know, things that uh, um, like Norman Rockwell, kind of. Yeah, it's it. Uh, but anyway, now snow globes. Um, yeah, what do they look like now? Now snow globes are you know are are glass because it's cheaper to make glass, and those five hundred and twenty five of them are all um, you know plastic. Like here's not a big deal, but here's one from Oregon. Um, but anyway, these um, these now are what you will find. And they're not nearly as in depth of um, a study on art and culture as these are today. So, um, so it, it's 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 just a study. And of, of the of the computers or of the phones, um, yeah, those go way back to scions to uh, um, um, voice modulators, um, VoIP phones in Europe, different kinds of connections. So. I can't throw them away. I'm not a hoarder, but an electronic, probably like John can appreciate, you know, technology is something that it just changes. So every little bit has a different story. Yeah. That's, that's, a good, that's a good question. What is the difference between a hoarder and a collector? <laughs> not much of that. In my, in my <laughs> it does. I'm just how, how, uh, how clearly they can rationalize it. <laughs> well, I was watching a show about comics, right, and, and how they came about, and all these people were buying all comics to collect them as collectibles, thought they are going to worth something. So I remember doing that too, right? Buy all these comics, and you think, one day I'm going to be rich, I'm going to sell all these comics as I got. And, and as soon as they started trying to cash them in at the local comic store, they realised they were only 10 cents in the dollar, the entire comic market collapsed. And that was because people were assuming that they could actually sell these comics for lots of money and nobody really wanted to buy them. And I've got a bunch of whole box of comics that I actually found out were worthless. And so it's kind of weird, right? You collect all this stuff thinking it's worth some value. And I think that's the only difference between a collector and a and a, a hoarder is that, some, you know, theoretically it was worth something when you collected it. <laughs> it may not be, though. <laughs> and then in the end, it's only worth what you put the value on. It's yeah, not yeah. worth actual dollars. It's just worth worth your memories and the things that it means mm. to you, right? Mm. Exactly. And that's one thing about books is you don't know what value it has to the reader. Bring it no. back, you know, there might be just mm. something, just one little nugget in there that someone's like could change their life. Yeah. Well, and and not just monetize, not just money value, right? There's so much value in oh. a book, knowledge value. Yeah. Um, everything there's so much in it that you can pull from a book and like you said even if it's just one little sentence or one little moment of the book that that helps that person. change their marriage their relationship their health uh, yeah yeah right. yeah here's a, here's a little slice real quick this is mount saint helens when it exploded oh and my gosh it has um, the ash that's involved and then here's um, a bit of the berlin wall when it came down when i was there Wow. So these are all, believe it or not, these are all snow globes. Well, and I love it as snow globes as evidence of culture, right? And a, a cultural shift. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of funny because you've also got cell phones up there as an evidence of cultural shift. And where, what will we be, you know, we or our kids collecting, um, you know, decades from now? What will be the evidence of cultural shift, and will they even be physical, or will they only be electrons? You know, the, um, and I know that there's this this talk among archaeologists right now, right? That that we are in, and we are in what is becoming an archaeological dead zone, mm -hmm. because all of these things are being created in a way that will not be apparent to at least physical archaeology. Um, you know, a hundred, five hundred thousand years from now. Um, well, exactly. I mean, 20 right, years right. ago, you look at it like we looked in, you know, the technology, right? We ended up with Facebook and Twitter, right? That's it. That's the only real large technology in, in, increases, really, when you think about it, because Silicon Valley got scared. 
in the early days and then they'd stopped investing so we've lost all that kind of you know we've done nothing much probably in the last hundred years that actually relates to stuff that you, know, you go back to yeah. stuff that they made in centuries ago it's quite amazing we, yeah. we do nothing now in comparison you know it's it is frightening really because you know we my husband and I, i'll look at that great fans of uh there's a uk show called the time machine uh with tony robbins and i come from used to live in york where it was the biggest archaeological you know it's huge archaeological area that if there's anywhere else in england they would have taken years and years excavating something but because there was so much archaeological history there from the romans from the vikings from the yeah. from the local um saxons and what have you it was just amazing and and you think now wh what are we leave like what have we got to leave there's not going to be nothing i mean there's going to well, be something yeah. but not no, nothing. And, and your books your your books are going to be part of the archaeological record that could survive mm -hmm. uh you know we're sending our books into the library of congress uh so that they're archived there who knows if the other copies will survive or even those will but you know, you look back to the you know the dark ages were the dark ages because literature literature was destroyed when when Rome was burned, and I'm going to take I take great pride in being Irish because there's this this great book I don't know if you've ever read it it's called How the Irish Saved the World, um, and, and it's 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 a real book and it's about how the Irish monasteries in Western Ireland were at one point in time, the sole repositories for all this classical knowledge that was destroyed with oh, the burning of Rome. Um, so think about the books that you're creating, the book that we've just created. For those people watching, the books they're gonna create, the authority they're creating, and the message they're passing on. Mm -hmm. um, you don't know if it's gonna be your child or your grandchild or your great-grandchild that's gonna pick up this book and read it, or if it's going to be some cultural archaeologist a thousand years from now who discovers the great writings of Jen Foster and Christine Robinson. <laughs> like you, 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 you don't know. Um, and if we don't put it out there, it'll never be found. It'll never, it'll never be discovered. And that's um, the legacy of it really, the the legacy. Book. It's there forever. Yeah. No. It's the, only, the only thing I think you can do except outside TV, not TV movies type of thing, this book's probably the only thing that has, leaves a legacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, on that note, we're going to wrap this up. In fact, we're going to end with this beautiful uh, trailer that Jen was kind enough to make for all of us. Um, it has been great having all of you as part of this project. It's been great having you as part of this uh, live cast. And for anyone who's watched the full length, uh, fantastic. Uh, my hat is off to you. You have more patience than me. Um, and we're grateful for you. But certainly pick up your copy of Authority. If you haven't, share it with others. Um, we'll be reporting out to our list the results of this launch probably in the next couple of weeks um, and uh, just totally excited to see what comes of it. Thank you all. God bless you all. Thank you all for being Thank part of it. Thank you so much That's for having us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.